we're talking today with Dr. Ulf Rainer Herwilmer uh, of Holland, Michigan. I guess you go by Yuli most of the time? Yuli is what friends call me. All right. So Yuli, start us off with some background on yourself, and you've got an interesting background. So where and when were you born? I was born May 31st, 1945, in what was the Soviet-occupied zone of Germany, namely the Eastern Zone. Mm -hmm. And before we proceed, I will take off my cover. There we are. And I will, we will go through my life history as to how I established my Navy career. Right. In May 30, on May 31st, 1945, there were very few doctors left to deliver me, but an old time OBGYN gentleman delivered me. I have never met him. Mm -hmm. I heard his name from Mama, but um, never went back uh, so far to my uh, birthplace. Mm -hmm. But um, in about a year later, my mother, as all moms are, very um, guarding of life, walked with me in a baby carriage, I was in a baby carriage at age one approximately, to the safety of the West, to Augsburg, Bavaria, Western Zone or West Germany. Okay. And did she tell you how she was able to get out of East Germany? She walked. But I mean, did the Soviets let her out? Uh, she ran across a, a platoon of Soviet soldiers and they did not harm her and they didn't harm me. Mm -hmm. So there is an element of compassion even with sometimes so-called enemies. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to remember that not all people are bad. Right. Now, where, but she yeah. walked about 232 miles and she would stay with farmers mm -hmm. and so on along the way, uh, did, who did, she didn't know, but she asked for refuge uh, for the night. Okay. Did she tell you how long it took? She said it took about uh, 12 to 14 days. Okay. She, would, uh, she would walk very fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a reasonable Pushing clip me. Uh, to go Pushing me. Now, where was your father at this time? Ah, my father was being released by the Americans in Livorno, Italy, because he had been drafted into the German army as a um, enlisted person first, and then he was promoted because he had one year of like the equivalency of a junior college. Mm -hmm. And he was going to become a lens crafter for Bausch and Lohm. And uh, well, the German government at that time, uh, the Führer's government at that time said, no, 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 no. You are going to be drafted. And he was drafted as a young man and uh, he became a second lieutenant, and then uh, in 1944, he was promoted to first lieutenant, and he was sent to Italy, uh, northern Italy, and he was captured outside of uh, Florence and taken by convoy, and many other German mm -hmm. soldiers were captured uh, without firing a shot, I might add, mm -hmm. in 1945. And thank God he did. And uh, he um, was taken to Livorno, which is now Camp Bradley for NATO mm -hmm. in Livorno. And he uh, could speak some English. And so what uh, the commanding officer uh, uh, was, uh, was interested in, some of these German soldiers that could speak uh, English because they needed German trans uh, they needed uh, translators to set up some stability in the Western zone mm -hmm. especially in Bavaria mm -hmm. where my father hails from okay. anyway uh, with a letter of recommendation after he was released after nine months in the POW camp he was uh, he went back to his home city of Augsburg where there was a huge U.S. Army base. A okay. uh, uh, couple kind of questions here. One of them is, uh, he's from Augsburg in, B in Bavaria. Uh, why were you born in East Germany? Yes. 
he and my mother met when he was retreating out of this Russia. They met. And they met in her home area, which was Gotha, Turingen. So did they meet after he was in the army then? Yes, he okay. was in the army. All right. Right. Okay. So anyway, but they, so that was her home yes, area. Yes, that was her home area. Okay, since he's not there, she's not going to be where That's he is. That's right. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That's All right. right. Uh, when did he get uh, back to Augsburg? He got back to Augsburg in 1946 in January or February of 1946. And he let somehow be known through the Americans that he was a translator at the U.S. Army base mm -hmm. uh, back in Augsburg and that he was safe. Mm -hmm. And can you try to join me? And through channels, which I don't really know about, he got that message through to Mama, right? which I mean, is amazing. Legally, she should have been able to go, but yes. the Soviet and East German authorities were, mm. were not always that interested in that. No, no. Okay. Uh, so, so That's she, the interesting a, thing about uh, the German personality. The German personality is, uh, which way does the flag blow, you know? <laughs> which way does the wind blow? I, I, I hate to say it that way, but it's true. Uh, the East Germans became better communists with their doctrine mm -hmm. than even the Soviets. And so the Soviets always had to keep a uh, firm handle in overseeing uh, the East German authorities because they were a little bit tenacious, very tenacious. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so basically, she's able to come and she can join your father. He's already there. He's right. got a job. He's got a job as a translator. All right. And then how long did they wind up um, staying in Germany? In Germany till uh, April, uh, late April 1953. My father was able to get a, uh, he met a major in the U.S. Army that he had translated for. Mm -hmm. And this major said, uh, I have parents in Virginia, and they live in Falls Church, but they have a 100-acre farm in near Warrington, Virginia, and they need an overseer and also a worker, mm -hmm. of course. And my father said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm an only child, so it wasn't a problem of uh, uh, immigrating. Mm -hmm. And through the Americans, he did get a visa for the three of us. Mm -hmm. And starting May 2nd, we traveled by train late April uh, to the ship in Rotterdam, the MS Nordam, which was part of the Holland America line. And I have the original suitcase. <laughs> well, I brought my paraphernalia, which well, I'm still proud of. Future generations of hurl wormers will, yeah. I know. Yeah. We'll hold that up here. Yes, yep. We are. That's the uh, original suitcase. It's got, got the original luggage tag on it. Starting May 2nd, 1953. And we were supposed to go for a nine day journey to the port city of New York. Mm -hmm. Well, all the berths were filled up. So we had to go to up the Hudson to Hoboken, New Jersey, to that same center, which was the port where that train accident just recently mm -hmm. occurred. I, I recognized the gates. I oh. said to my wife of 48 years, I said, Patty, I remember those gates. And I didn't understand it as an eight-year-old eight you. child. Mm -hmm. and. I, I said, why these big gates? Well, we had to go through customs, of course. And we had to show the, Papa had to show the visa, mm -hmm. uh, visas and so on. But I might add, my most historic moment of the voyage was short of New York Harbor. That's the very first time I heard the Star Spangled Banner being played as we went past the Statue of Liberty in different dialects trying to sing the song. I didn't know the words because mm -hmm. I really didn't speak much English. And 
but I remember that. Mm -hmm. And to this day, when I see the statue in person, I get tears. Okay. Because America, to me, is represented 100% by that statue. And that's what we Americans have to think about. All this other thing that's going on presently, mm -hmm. just remember the statue and remember who gave it to us mm -hmm. as a gift. France, France, liberty, justice for all. Mm -hmm. And welcoming, welcoming uh, immigrants or welcoming people to this country of ours, this great country of ours. Why did your uh, parents want to come to the U.S. in the first place? More opportunities. Mm -hmm. 1952, 1953 were bad years in Germany. The Berlin uh, uprising was occurring. Poland was uprising a little bit. Um, Hungary was starting. Not yet, but Soon. Uh, soon, yeah. In 56, uh, the Hungarians finally did have the uprising. And slowly but surely, Czechoslovakia and right. so on. Okay. But Berlin uh, started it, and uh, the Soviets punished uh, severely. Mm -hmm. So, and it took a little, a little while longer before you get the full economic recovery in West Germany, which does yes, actually happen in the yes. 50s. Okay, uh, but he's got... Your father speaks English. He's got right. good American connections. We, okay, but, so now... Oh, before we mm -hmm. go on, my father's... In 1946, there was no West German currency yet. Mm -hmm. There was no West German Deutschmark. So my father's pay by the Americans, they could not pay him in U.S. dollars. They paid him in cigarettes. Two cartons of Lucky Strikes per month. Mm -hmm. for translating. And then in 47, when the Deutschmark came along, he got paid in Deutschmarks. Right. Okay. Uh, so now you actually, you, you, you get to Hoboken, get off the ship, mm -hmm. go through customs. Now what do you do? Then we were picked up in Hoboken by our sponsors, Mr. and Mrs. Chu, and very nice people. Very nice people. And they drove us from Hoboken, New Jersey. It was all probably around noon time, and we drove in a big Buick. I had never seen a car like that. Mm -hmm. And naturally, as a, as a young child, I was in the back seat. Mm -hmm. And I almost sank out of, out of appearance, you know. <laughs> in the back seat, I'm going, my goodness, this is something. And uh, he drove us to the farm, and uh, the next day, Papa was not only the overseer of one other worker, but also a worker. He was on the tractor already the next day on May 12th, right. <laughs> 1953. And he was getting paid 25 cents an hour, but it was a start. And he had a place to live. And he had a place to live. Mama w took care of the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, what was life like for you there? Is, it, is this where you grew up, or did you move? Uh, oh, no, no. We moved about uh, nine to ten months later from the farm because the minimum wage, slowly but surely, we came to find out, was 75 cents an hour. Mm -hmm. And I attended Warrington Public Schools. But I might add, this is now 1953, and I attended the white school mm -hmm. on top of the hill in Warrington, Virginia. And the African-American school was at the bottom of the hill, surrounded by a big fence and so on. And I was put back into first grade. I had been in first grade and second grade in German mm -hmm. public school in right. Augsburg. But make a long story short, um, one day I got jeered by the first graders, uh, first grade uh, boys. And uh, it was an old World War II thing. Uh, Hotsy Totsy, another newborn Nazi. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit upset. So I decided to run down to the African American school. The white teacher and the white principal start chasing me and saying, uh, you cannot play with those folks. And I asked why not. And I knew how to pronounce the W's mm -hmm. rather than the right. v Vinot. Yeah. 
why not? And no answer. And worse yet, the closer I got, I could run very fast, especially downhill. The closer I got to the African American school, they waved me off, the teachers and the students on the playground. They said, uh, white boy, we cannot play with you. And I asked again, why not? And no answer came. And I remember that vividly. And that was, that was, has been imprinted in my brain for life. The discrimination, the, uh, the attitude of discrimination hurts everybody. Mm -hmm. And we must not forget uh, that we cannot divide, we cannot divide peoples. Look at what happened in Germany. Mm -hmm. When you isolated groups and did genocide and whatnot. But anyway, Mama, being a tough lady, she tried to find work in Warrington, Virginia. So she went first to the white business owners in Warrington, and they would not hire her because it was eight years after mm -hmm. World War II. And so she marched herself into the black uh, or the African-American ghetto part of Warrington. The first snack bar she came to, she walked in as a white woman and said, I need a job. <laughs> and the owner said, ma'am, uh, um, I, I can hire you, but uh, blah, 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 do you know what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't care. And he said, really, you want to work as a waitress? And he, she says, yeah, I need a job. He hired her on the spot for 50 cents an hour. So they made the minimum wage of 75 cents an hour. OK, I take it this, is, this didn't last too long. No. Like I said, nine to 10 months. Mm -hmm. And my parents accumulated enough savings they paid for the entire trip, which was at that time $500. And that was a lot. Mm -hmm. That was a lot for the three of us to come over mm -hmm. from Germany or Holland, you know, Rotterdam, uh, to America. And the sponsor insisted. He said, no, 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 you keep that money. My father said, no, nine. <laughs> Not going to do it. So then he had tied up with a GI friend of his that he knew from Augsburg mm -hmm. who lived in Connecticut near Westport, Connecticut. And this friend helped us get to Connecticut mm -hmm. through the YMCA in Westport, Connecticut to a botany professor named Dr. Ken Hander Henderson who was a botany professor at Yale. But his sideline business was raising 30,000 orchid plants mm -hmm. in his private greenhouses mm -hmm. right across the street from Long Island Sound. And my mother became the maid in the household of the Hendersons. And we had a free apartment there. And my father was the orchid tenderer. He and another worker tended 30,000 orchid plants. And we stayed in Westport, Connecticut, or Westport area, uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, uh, about uh, two years. Mm -hmm. Because then a recession hit, and he had another GI friend <laughs> in Buffalo, New mm -hmm. York. My, the network of Americans that my father had because of his job mm -hmm. as a translator. All right. So, uh, so when did you go to Buffalo? Buffalo, 1955. Okay. Uh, summer of 55. And um, I started um, uh, public school there, public school number 37, inner city, Buffalo. And we had an apartment at first in Buffalo, uh, near downtown Buffalo. And then one day I was walking to school. I had to walk to PS 37. It was about a mile away. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I passed past a house on Elm Street in Buffalo, so just south of Roswell Park uh, uh, Institu uh, Memorial, it was called, Roswell Park Memorial Hospital for cancer. 
Um, and I saw this house for sale, you know, and I told my parents, this was 1956, I told my parents when I got home, and they looked at the house and they said, I think we can afford this house, mm -hmm. you know? And that was our first uh, American house mm -hmm. that, that my parents bought. And uh, then after uh, public school 37, and I won the Sons of the American Revolution medal in eighth grade at public school 37. I still have it in, at home here. My children will probably, you know. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the high school then I started attending was Hutchinson Central Technical High School in Buffalo. But then my father's job with Remick Rand, he was in the microfilm business because like I said way long time ago in the interview that uh, he he was a lens crafter mm -hmm. so he loved photography right. and so microfilm was the data storage system for all businesses etc mm -hmm. so Remington Wren transferred him from Buffalo to Detroit and in Detroit what was very interesting uh, this was now 1959 uh, I went to Cass Tech High School, transferred there, in electrical electronics, but make a long story short, at age 13, my family doctor became Dr. Raul Torres, who I did not mention until now. Dr. Raul Torres was a captain, Medical Corps, U.S. Army, stationed in Augsburg. When I came along with mom, with mama, my father took me in his arms to aboard the U.S. Army base to Dr. Raul Torres, who he had been translating for mm -hmm. also, and said, can you help my son? Because we had very little nutrition mm -hmm. under the Soviets. Uh, and historically or politically, I can understand it. Mm -hmm. The Soviets lost 10% of their population in that horrible war. Revenge was on their minds. Babies were useless. Senior citizens were absolutely useless too. And uh, I was sustained besides God's love and mama's love by flour, water, uh, occasionally some milk, carrots, pureed carrots, carrot juice, a blessing mm -hmm. that I'm here. But he looked at me and he had my father explain, where this kid, where has this kid been? Mm -hmm. You know, he says, well, we have to help him, mm -hmm. age one. And he says, I'm gonna plug him into an IV, he's dehydrated. <laughs> and uh, plugs me into an American IV his wife, Dr. Estelle Torres, they were the first married couple to graduate from Wayne State University Medical School in Detroit in 1943, but he had been drafted into mm -hmm. the Army. Um, he calls her long distance to Detroit, took him 30 minutes as the history goes, and he says, Estelle, You've got to send formula mm -hmm. <laughs> and vitamins for this German infant. And naturally, she's thinking, what the heck? Well, you yeah. know, what, have what you the done? heck are you doing with a German infant? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he explained it. And he says, we've got to help this infant. And by God, she would send the materials over uh, to his APO box. Mm -hmm. And anyway, slowly but surely, and he left the army in 47 and set up, uh, he and his wife set up a practice in Hamtramck mm -hmm. because she was Polish. He was uh, from Granville actually and his father was a family doctor in Granville. Right. So there's there in the Detroit area so when right. you get to there. Age 13, mm -hmm. he becomes my family doctor. Mm -hmm. At age 16, he pulls me into his private office. And he says to me, you owe. And I 
I thought, you know, the monetary thing. Mm -hmm. He says, no, 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 no. You owe society. Uh, he didn't say society, but he says, you owe. And I said, okay. He says, we're going to get you into medical school one way or another. Mm -hmm. I said, you are? But I like electrical electronics mm -hmm. at Cass Tech High School. He says, that's okay. That's okay. You're going to be an engineer for people. I said, I am? Oh, okay. <laughs> going, oh my goodness. And I listened. <laughs> I listened. Who helped me get into medical school? Dr. Al Torres. Because his own father was a deal. Mm -hmm. His own brother was a deal. His brother-in-law was a deal. And uh, the father was deceased of Dr. Al Torres, but uh, the two other gentlemen and Dr. Raul Torres, even though he was an MD, wrote me nice letters of recommendation, and I did get accepted to uh, Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine. Okay. Now, where had you gone to, to college for undergraduate? Wayne State University. Okay. And were you still living at home while you were doing that, or did you live on campus? Uh, no. My parents, uh, my father's job, he was hired by a competitor mm -hmm. named Kodak at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were really big into... Uh, uh, microfilming. And so what happened, my parents, uh, my father was transferred to Toronto, Canada, Ontario, Canada, mm -hmm. and as a microfilm uh, uh, salesperson and microfilm system set up mm -hmm. in 1965. And it was about that time that the banks were moving out of Montreal because of the Quebec separatist mm -hmm. movement. Banks get scared, and rightfully so, of little revolutions, you know. And uh, so he became sort of the microfilm specialist for the banks and, and so on. And uh, uh, he did very, very well, okay. I might add. But in the meantime, you've got but I, you're, you're I, back I here I started in uh, living with uh, friends and so on. And then I finally wound up at a fraternity house off campus at Wayne State University mm -hmm. near the art museum. <laughs> and, uh, it was an adventure. Mm -hmm. and it was a medical fraternity, but they rented to pre-med also. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, I got this scoop about medical school from them too, uh, besides Dr. Raul Torres and so on. And uh, uh, so make a long story short, uh, in uh, 1968, I had the uh, interview, but be, uh, from 1967 to 1968, I, um, a student taught and taught general science in the inner city of Detroit, eighth grade, okay? And uh, it was Sherrard Junior High School. And then evening school, I taught at Ford High School Math, because I love math. Mm -hmm. It's almost a German trait, you know. <laughs> and and uh, um, I made enough money and so on. And in the meantime, I had met my future wife mm -hmm. in the organic chemistry lab at Wayne State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was not my lab partner, but I looked at her <laughs> very eyingly. I said, geez, this lady's on the ball, <laughs> and, and pretty, and everything, you know. And so I didn't have the gumption, uh, you know, the courage to uh, ask her out for a date, but we bumped just serendipitously into each other, and I asked her out for a date, and the rest is history. Right. And we got married in 1968, just before medical school started okay. in now, September. Now, at this point, of course, the Vietnam War is in yes. full swing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the draft is, is there, yes. uh, and you're certainly eligible for that. Yes. Now, while you're yes. in college as an undergraduate, there's a four-year deferment, but yes. so that's going to be running out. But you're yes. heading to medical school, so how did that and work? And that was for a draft deferment, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but was there a catch to that? If you were going to medical school and not being drafted, did Uncle Sam expect you oh. to go into the uh, military? After graduation, yes. Absolutely. They had a program where you could join during medical school, and I did. Mm -hmm. I did. I joined just before the start of my senior year in medical school as a full commissioned ensign. Okay. 
okay. which would be second lieutenant mm -hmm. equivalency, full time, no uniform, just go to school, keep up your grades, <laughs> and then you owe us time. Okay. So when you signed up, now why did you sign up for that? Did you figure you were going to get drafted anyway, so you might as well do this? Or? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, and I said, I owe this country. I owe this country. And my wife uh, was in full support of my uh, uh, Navy application and everything, and she actually helped uh, fill in the... She, she's much better at filling in applications. I'm the astronaut, and okay. she's Houston Space Center. All right. So, so why did you choose the Navy? Because my father-in-law was a chief petty officer during World War II in the Navy, and he got me in touch with Senator Philip Hart and also with his commanding officer, who was a rear admiral by that time, in Detroit, mm -hmm. had not retired, of course. And both of those gentlemen wrote me beautiful letters of recommendation mm -hmm. to the Navy. And, uh, and my father-in-law helped instigate that. He was a okay. great man. So this is kind of a, this is a program that you just don't sign up for and walk into. You no, have to be recommended. No, you have to be uh, recommended. Okay. Now, when you first go in, and that, before that first year, do they give you any kind of Navy training, or does that come after you graduate from medical school? I hate to say this. There was no Navy training. Mm -hmm. All I had to do is the paperwork was done for me at the, uh, uh, in Chicago itself, at the AFI station, there was the recruiting office upstairs. Mm -hmm. They filled in all the paperwork, sent it to Great Lakes because that was my theoretical duty station. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, at that time, no training other than uh, we, we did receive a manual in the mail <laughs> saying the, you know, the regulations and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, 30 days of leave during that senior year, um, pay, full pay, full benefits, mm -hmm. even even insurance, health insurance, mm -hmm. and uh, life insurance. Okay. Well, you were a Navy officer. A Navy point. officer. Okay. All right. So that you do that. So that's your last year. You finish medical school. Now what right. happens to you? Then I was accepted to Bethesda Naval Hospital because I applied for uh, the internship there. And I'll never forget, I had to be interviewed on a Saturday morning by the internship director, who was Captain Van Houten, God rest his soul. And I come to find out his brother was a DO mm -hmm. <laughs> in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So I, I came to find that out later. I, he told me later. But he interviewed me, he was chief of anesthesiology, he interviewed me on a Saturday morning because I had to call him long distance uh, because I was on a senior student rotation in Detroit at a hospital. And uh, the <coughs> program director of us medical students, he said, no, no, you have to stay Friday night. I mean, up to mm -hmm. Friday night. I said, but, but I have an interview, you know. So guess what mm -hmm. this young buck and my wife did? I mean, we drove through the night and we changed clothing and so mm -hmm. on uh, to appear g well in appearance, you know. No uniform, mm -hmm. I had no uniform. And uh, he interviews me and he says, yes, you're accepted. You're accepted to the internship program. And I took the old fashioned internship because I really didn't know what specialty or mm -hmm. what, whatever I wanted to do. I was more family practice oriented initially. Okay. Did you do your internship at Great Lakes or elsewhere? No, nope, at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Okay. And uh, that's when he told me, uh, you know who is the best doctor in our family? And I said, I don't know. He says, my brother who's a DO family doctor mm -hmm. in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I said, oh. And he says, well, congratulations. You'll be uh, one of two uh, inter uh, DO interns okay. here at Bethesda. And just for people who aren't really maybe aware of the difference between DO is doctor of osteopathy, so 
different program from the standard MD medical doctor, uh, although right. you get essentially most of the same training, just a little bit different approach. Yes. But traditionally, there had been some prejudice against DOs from the MDs. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. Uh, the last state to give us practice rights was Mississippi, not surprisingly. Oh, excuse me. Um, but uh, the military gave us the opportunities of a lifetime. Uh, and that was one of the other reasons I, I said, I. I want to apply to the military because their graduate programs are recognized by both. Mm -hmm. And that's the main thing. You have to be recognized by credentialing bodies mm -hmm. and certification bodies uh, in any field, in any profession. And at that time, uh, the military, and to this present day, mm -hmm. the military is wide open for all qualified mm -hmm. uh, people. And uh, I was just fortunate enough, after that internship year, I was the first DO uh, resident to be accepted to a pediatric residency program at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Okay. Uh, talk a little bit about that first year at Bethesda as an intern. It was very interesting. The uh, most... Be careful with the microphone. Now. Yes. The most biased service was the surgical pr uh, program because at that time DOs were not accepted to MD surgical residencies or even rotations um, and it brought back the memories of Warrington, Virginia in my own mind and I got to feel the empathy for people who get discriminated against for no reason, for no reason. Not even willing to give you a chance to show your abilities. Mm -hmm. And that's evil in my estimation. That's the most evil concept I know of uh, because you can destroy people much easier than you can uplift people. And it's so easy to discriminate. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. And am I good at not discriminating? No. Th there are times where I catch myself and I say, Yuli, don't judge. Mm -hmm. Do not judge. You're a mere mortal being like the rest. Okay. So as you're in, a, in mm -hmm. principle, as an intern, you would kind of rotate through all the different all the different services, but and I rotated through pediatrics. That mm -hmm. was one of my first rotations. I loved it mm -hmm. because of my own background. Right. At age one, I said, "This is it. This is it," because pediatrics is the future of the society. Mm -hmm. If you can't deal with children, I mean. Your generation is going to die out. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think of a naval hospital as, as treating servicemen who, who tend to be older than needing yes, pediatrician. Yes, but the dependents. Mm -hmm. You have to treat the whole family. You just have to. And on the grocery bags at the uh, commissaries, the most difficult job is being a Navy wife. At that time, it was predominantly male mm -hmm. dominated, you know. But so the wives would go shopping at the commissary and so on at the PXs. But on the grocery bags, yeah, they had the most difficult job is being a Navy wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's true. I mean, they support the family while you're on missions or whatever. And uh, it's a team effort. And it's, it's a difficult effort. Okay. At times. Now, of course, at that point, that first year, you're right there at Bethesda. So yes. you, you get to go home at night. Right. Uh, or at least right. whenever you're off of, off you're of right. your shifts. Uh, now, uh, after that, the year residency, of internship, the same thing. So now what you do you got do? to go home after your shifts, mm -hmm. uh, usually. Okay. So what did years. you do after that first year? Uh, after the first year, I got accepted to that uh, pediatric residency mm -hmm. for three years. Right. And then after the pediatric residency, I was supposed to go to Great Lakes. I had orders in hand to go to Great Lakes because we wanted to go back home to Michigan and so on. And um, all of a sudden, uh, I was actually taking a very sick infant 
from Bethesda Naval Hospital to Oakland Naval Hospital via air vac, uh, medical air mm -hmm. evacuation out of Andrews Air Force Base. At that time, it was called Andrews Air mm -hmm. Force Base. And it took us uh, 24 hours to get to Oakland because they stop at, uh, at all types of bases mm -hmm. to pick up the, the ill, mm -hmm. the sick people. And the reason this baby had to be transferred is because both parents were active duty Navy on special projects mm -hmm. that I never knew about and I don't want to know <laughs> about it. And, uh, but they wanted to see their baby. Uh, and it was a very critically ill patient. And uh, there was no uh, pediatric nurse with me, so I took care of the infant and so on. And we got that infant safely to Oakland Naval Hospital late at night, their time. And um, the parents uh, were there, and they just hugged and, you know. Mm -hmm. And they knew, too, that it was a terminal type of deformity mm -hmm. uh, or malformation. But at least they got to see mm -hmm. their, their child, their son. And uh, then um, my orders while I was aboard the plane the co-pilot comes back to me and says, your orders for Great Lakes have been rescinded. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just got this message. And I said, it did? And he says, yes, you're going to Annapolis, to the Naval Academy. You're going to be in uh, chief of pediatrics there. I said, I am? How come? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, how? Well, you know, that's a nicer duty station than mm -hmm. Great Lakes. And I said, I know, I know. But uh, my wife was already out looking for mm -hmm. apartments or homes or whatever because her sister lives right near Great Lakes and brother-in-law mm -hmm. uh, live, lived right, or live still right near Great Lakes. So make a long story short, I called her as soon as I landed, mm -hmm. you know. I said, uh, Patty we're going to Annapolis. Annapolis? But I, I'm looking at houses here yeah. in, Great Lake, yeah. uh, in the Great Lakes area. And she, I said, well, forget it. I mean, Navy has its own methods, and I, I, I'm going to follow my orders, of course. And she says, yeah, you have to. So we moved up to Annapolis. It was wonderful. Now, what years were you there? From July 76, bicentennial year, and uh, I left there uh, December uh, 30th. And December 31st started my fellowship in allergy, immunology, and asthma between Georgetown and Bethesda Naval Hospital. Mm -hmm. And that lasted two years. And it, it was great, great training. And right across the street from Bethesda Naval Hospital, are the National Institutes of Health, mm -hmm. all the different institutes. And one of the institutes is the National Institute of Infectious Diseases and Allergy. Well, every Thursday afternoon, we got to go as trainees on rounds and lectures at the National Institutes of Allergy mm -hmm. and <laughs> Infectious yeah. Diseases. And so it just broadened my horizons even then. And then in uh, January of 1980, I became chief of allergy at Bethesda Naval Hospital. And I had a, uh, an assistant, uh, another physician who was an allergist, wonderful allergist. And uh, uh, w the two of us ran that department. But I came up with the idea through my uh, uh, previous uh, chief uh, of allergy to make visits to the outlying facilities to save the government money. Mm -hmm. Because for a patient visit to our clinic at Bethesda is usually, was usually in the neighborhood of, oh, 2000 or $3,000 per member because they had to cut orders, they had to get to per diem, and they had to stay in an expensive area of Washington. Uh, so 
uh, he told me, he says, Yuli, just keep up your visits to the outlying facilities. That was the best advice I ever had. So where would we go? I love submarines. Don't psychoanalyze me. And submarines were the main weapon, I think, that won the Cold War. I really believe that to my dying day. And I had the pleasure and honor when I was a lowly intern in August 1972 of hearing all this commotion outside of my emergency room. That was my emergency room on rotation that whole month. I hear this commotion outside. It's Admiral Zumwalt, who was the chief of naval operations, mm -hmm. literally dragging in Admiral Hyman Rickover. And I'm the doctor on duty, and I have several corpsmen or medics, mm -hmm. as they're called in the Navy, corpsmen mm -hmm. and corps waves. And he says to me, young doctor, I think, I think uh, uh, Admiral Rickover is having a heart attack. And I said, oh my God, yes. I, I, you could tell just mm -hmm. the, the, oh, it was awful. We got the gurney. I mean, everything worked like clockwork. Mm -hmm. And everything just went super well. And I respected uh, Admiral Zumwalt, first of all, before even mm -hmm. getting to meet him, as a real human being. And he did reform the Navy as far as some of the standards and so on, which is great, which is great. You have to sometimes think outside of the box as a leader. And, uh, but you do it peacefully, slowly. You have to do it slow. And anyway, uh, he he stayed right at the bedside with uh, Admiral Rickover, and Rickover said, "I I don't want to stay here. You're you're all overreacting." Mm -hmm. And I said, "No, sir, we're not overreacting. You've had a massive heart attack, and we're going to get you into the coronary care unit, and we're going to transport you there with the help of uh, people." Mm -hmm. And uh, Zumwalt stayed that night with him. He helped us pull, push the gurney and everything. And he says, can I do something, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think he carried the IV bag and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how down to earth these yeah. gentlemen were. But he, uh, Admiral Rickover is shouting, you know, I, I don't want to stay here. I don't think I need yeah. to stay here. I feel better, you know? Mm -hmm. So we got him into the coronary care unit and everything was wonderful. And uh, he remembered my name years later because in 1983, shortly before I left uh, the active Navy, mm -hmm. he was outside of our allergy clinic because we gave all the vaccines mm -hmm. for mobilization. Right. Well, he had been invited by the uh, Chinese to inspect their nuclear Navy. They were going to honor him. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't need those vaccines. I'm not going to get those vaccines. And I, I heard the commotion. I went out there. His second wife, who was the nurse for the first wife, mm -hmm. who had passed on, um, his second wife was a little bit younger. And she said to him, Jaime, listen to this young doctor, me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I said, Admiral, I don't think you remember me, but, mm -hmm. uh, and I had a badge on. Yeah. Um, and uh, I said, that August night in 1972, when Admiral Zumwalt brought you in for that heart attack, we got you through that with the help of God. And uh, this time, you do need vaccines mm -hmm. because we need many vaccines. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to get sick over there. And he wasn't going for about two weeks anyway, three weeks, so it would have had time for the vaccines to really work. He says, but I hear they make you sick. And I said, yes, they do. That's why, you know, you, you have time to rest a little bit. I can't rest, you know. But the wife calmed him down and said, 
listen to him. <laughs> listen to the same doctor. Mm -hmm. And that that's my famous story about Admiral Rickover. All right. Now, I want to back up a little bit as we <laughs> cover this first uh, full time you have in active duty. In the <laughs> I, mean, I asked <laughs> you early on in that first, did, did you ever get any kind of Navy training in terms of how to march and salute and that kind of thing? Uh, yes, it was about a week before the internship started. Okay. At Bethesda. Mm -hmm. And how seriously did they take that? Uh, I, I would say moderately seriously. They said, basically, you, you have inspections and those you have to take seriously. The uniform has to be crisp and clean. And this is still mm -hmm. my uniform. I still fit in it. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> People get jealous. They yep, say, yep. how can you fit in this uniform from 1993, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh. I, I well, it's okay. from 93 rather than 1973. Yeah, so, okay, that's right. Get a little bit of help yeah, there. I, I had an older uniform. Because you stayed fine. in the reserves until 93. Yes, so, yes. All right. Uh, so now you so you and, basically and, learned. Uh, yeah, we we learned to march um, during that week and and so on. It was and who to salute, who you don't have to salute first or anything like that, and you can salute just out of respect. I mean, and uh, the medical department in any of the military branches are unique. And some of the active duty military people uh, felt at that time that you weren't really in the real military. Mm -hmm. But in 1984, I got selected to go for combat casualty simulation down to Texas. Mm -hmm. And then I learned more there about the real military. And that's when I aligned myself with the Marines mm -hmm. <laughs> in battlefield simulation. Mm -hmm. and because I was older and not so, well, I was physically active, of course, but not, not like the uh, Marines. They made me the radio man. And they had three Marine guards around me at all times <laughs> in the battlefield or on the periphery of the battlefield. So I would call in for airstrikes, you know, against the enemy. So you got, well, because Navy corpsmen get training with the yes, Marines, yes. sort of a combat field they're, training. They're excellent. And, and so they, they do this. So in a way, you were getting the doctor's equivalent of that, at least the reserve doctor's yes, equivalent yes, of that, yes. on a limited scale. On a limited scale. So they're showing you a little bit about what the Marines do mm -hmm. in the field. So Even helicopter rides mm -hmm. down in Texas. And uh, uh, nighttime simulation. I felt an M16 in my back, and I had the armband, the Red Cross armband. And I said, uh, what about Geneva Convention? What convention? Boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And in Vietnam, to tell the truth, I've known, I knew Corman, and one in particular, uh, he became a captain. He went, he was a Mustanger went through. He was my administrative duty officer, John Ouchhorn. Wonderful person. He's, he's still with us, thank God. Wonderful, wonderful person. And he uh, told me about the horrors of Vietnam when he was a corpsman. They initially had to wear the helmet mm -hmm. with the Red Cross on it. That was the perfect target for the Viet Cong. And finally, I mean, an order came down. You don't have to wear that helmet. Because they want to they wanna kill off the medics, the radio people. <laughs> exactly. Disenfranchise the whole unit, you know. And the various places where you might wind up in an armed conflict from the 80s or certainly more recently yes. may well be places where they have no particular interest in things like that's these right conventions. I have a wonderful buddy currently he's a physician's assistant at Cherry Street his name is Larry Brewer and he is wonderful he was um, in the Air Force initially in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive mm -hmm. one of his friends 
in the distance was blown apart by a shell. After that, he went into the army, became a nurse, and then a physician's assistant. And he's still a physician's assistant at the Cherry Street Healthcare System after 30 some years. And I used to volunteer there. And that's how I got to meet him. So during the time when you were uh, in the Navy, I mean, did <laughs> you notice any kind of echoes or reverberations from Vietnam or responses to the war, things like that? How did that affect what you saw? I saw some of the returning POWs. We all did. And they, they, they had the post-traumatic stress disorder, totally. I mean, it was, it was so tragic. And some of the doctors didn't recognize it completely because it was relatively it's new. Almost like in 1970, yeah. three, four. In exactly, yeah. exactly. And it was. It was that was talked about, and we knew we started noticing problems already then about the defoliant. Mm -hmm. Slowly but yeah. surely, Agent Orange, right? Agent Orange, and ironically, it was Admiral Zumwalt that recommended that it be used along the Mekong River to defoliate the hiding places for the Viet Cong, right. because we were losing soldiers uh, along the Mekong uh, every day, every day. It was, the casualty rate was, was really bad. So, and he was reassured <coughs> by Dow Chemical <laughs> that it's safe. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not safe for plants, but it's safe for humans. Mm -hmm. Well, we know better now. And um, I have seen Agent Orange diseases I have seen them personally, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's horrific. It's horrific. And it should all teach us a lesson that chemicals do hurt the immune system, first of all, and they can cause many problems with different organ systems, including the immune system. Admiral Zumwalt's son, Admiral Zumwalt went into a depression because his own son volunteered for Vietnam along the Mekong River. Mm -hmm. So he was constantly exposed to Agent Orange. He dies of lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's one of the diseases. Anything that alters the immune system is going to cause trouble for us. Any chemical. I don't care what it is. All right. Um, now, Another side of the whole Vietnam yep. thing is essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's political, but it's also there's a transformation of the military, it becomes all volunteer. Uh, you yes. know, there's various responses to the anti-war movement, and then there's a Congress that at times is going to be less inclined to provide funding. Now, within the Navy itself, at least <laughs> the part of it that you're dealing with, um, did that affect, any of that stuff sort of affect the morale of the people in the service, or did uh, you stay pretty much the with same? With some of the enlisted it did. And I must be honest, uh, some of the officers too. Um, I was initially for the Vietnam War, but when the Tet Offensive occurred, because we had been told that we, we have this thing under control, but a guerrilla movement, ISIS for example now, it's difficult to control mm -hmm. militarily, standard military operations against a guerrilla movement. The British couldn't do it in 1776 mm -hmm. <laughs> or in 1775 with Lexington and Concord. The con I mean the yep. militia, the Minutemen were guerrillas, mm -hmm. figuratively. Or at least well, when they fought that way, that was most sure. successful. And case. the British yeah. said, this isn't a gentlemanly way of waging war. And I'm going, oh my God, <laughs> what is gentlemanly? What defeated the Germans in the Soviet Union? Partisans, primarily. Well, uh, I mean, uh, primarily, but, but they were part of it. But they were part of yeah. the uh, Red Army. And, and yeah. history it is... It became a lot more complicated than it was supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and surrounding Leningrad, the Russians should take a lesson from that. 
what they're doing in Aleppo. It's, it's their Lenin, uh, I mean, it's the reverse of, well, the Nazis did Leningrad. Mm -hmm. The Russians are doing Aleppo. I mean, it never ends, it never ends All in right. humanity. Uh, now, to think back for the period when you're on right. your active duty in, mm -hmm. in the Navy, um, you're still on your microphone again. Oh, yeah. oh I'm sorry. Yeah. They like to talk with your hands, okay. Uh, are there other memories that kind of stand out for you from that period? Yes. The, the people at the top during my active duty years of 12, mm -hmm. uh, well, 11 active duty years uh, on and off at Bethesda and at, at mm -hmm. Annapolis too, the higher ups, if you were willing to work, if your morale was, if you were uplifting mm -hmm. to people, they loved you. It was that simple. Mm -hmm. And treat each person with respect, which they deserve. Mm -hmm. The golden rule. Follow the golden rule, and you will succeed in America. If you don't want to follow the golden rule, and you think you're the hot shot mm -hmm. of everything, guess what? People will. Hmm. If they see you're trying, and if they see that you're really struggling, and, but you're trying, they will give you a lending hand. Mm -hmm. We are the most generous nation on the planet. Who supports the United Nations mm -hmm. for the most part? Who supports NATO for the most part? <laughs> Who supports CETO for the most part? I mean, you know, Southeast yeah. Asian Treaty Organization. Oh, that was there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, it's America okay. and with manpower and supplies right. and everything. Uh, now, how was time in the, Na in the Naval Academy? How was that a different job? Wonderful. It was wonderful. But I came to find out that the midshipmen were students. Mm -hmm. Students first. Yes, they had some family traditions to uphold. And several of them came to me confidentially after the first year, okay, freshman year. They call it the fourth year or mm -hmm. something yeah. like that. And they say to me, uh, I don't want to go. I want to go uh, further. Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, chances are, uh, well, my father was in the Navy, mm -hmm. my grandfather was in the Navy, and so on. I said, that's wonderful. That's wonderful for history mm -hmm. and you. That's history. You've got your own life. And it comes time, sooner or later, you've got to make your own decision about it, about your own mm -hmm. lifestyle, your own style of living. And if you drop out before the sophomore year, I mean, if you drop out before the end of the sophomore year, you owe no obligated time. Mm -hmm. at, at, that, at that time, it was a, the thing. Right. So several did drop out, but most stayed in, and they were, they were very good, very good, upstanding citizens, and I think they're going to be, or they are, yeah. good leaders, mm -hmm. good leaders. And uh, they invited me to the uh, lunches at uh, Bancroft Hall, where they eat up to 6,000 calories, because they're constantly, you know, exercising and everything else. 6,000 calories. And they kept looking at me, you're not eating enough. I said, I'm, I'm eating enough for an adult, yeah. you know. But they, they were good. They were good. And we sponsored several midshipmen. And they all have been wonderful, and we keep in touch with them, and they're successful in industry. Yeah. What does it mean to sponsor them? Oh, when they're uh, freshmen especially. Okay. Uh, they, they look for sponsors in the community. We stayed in Annapolis from 76 to 83. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided not to move out of Annapolis. Okay. And um, we were from Michigan, so we sponsored three uh, Michiganders, mm -hmm. uh, midshipmen, freshman midshipmen, and they they couldn't couldn't get over the fact that I 
I didn't know some of the rules, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they they taught me, you know, very privately, very non-threatening, right. you know, some of the rules and so on, which which was helpful to me, especially as chief of a department, you know. <laughs> Maybe out of those things. <laughs> but they were good. They were good. I, I think America can be proud of its military academies. Um, they're not the uh, type that uh, would push the button, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, let's say it that way. And the wonderful thing about our U.S. Constitution, as always, always, there's civilian control over the military. And that was, that's what helped us, has saved us countless number of times. If you can fire the commander-in-chief, like Nixon, mm -hmm. my goodness, that's unheard of. Also, fire a big guy in the army like a MacArthur if he makes too much trouble. Right. Yeah. All right. When he refuses to salute the commander in chief. Okay. Uh, now, kind of other things that kind of stand out for you. I mean, kind of the active duty period, or have we hit kind of most of the main points of that now? Uh, most of the main points. Okay. Now, you stay in the reserves for some time. And yes, you do have a nine and a half years. You have, and you had mentioned already getting training with the Marines in 84. Yes. Uh, did you get other training stints or well, other things? Well, what I did, uh, I was uh, commanding officer of the medical unit in Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. and then in Muskegon, and then they closed Muskegon on us, so I went back to Grand Rapids as commanding officer of the medical unit. And what we did, we had the different corpsmen and the different officers. Uh, we had uh, several nurses, we had an anesthesiologist, we had a neurologist to give lectures to the other units, to just get them up to date on CPR, mm -hmm. to get them up to date on what's happening in medicine for their own care, too. Uh, and who knows, uh, like the CBs, they see em medical emergencies mm -hmm. a lot when they're, on, when they're doing construction work. Oh my goodness. And one of my best friends to this day yet, was a uh, chief in the uh, CBs at Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. And he and I stay in touch, you know. And uh, great, uh, great person. And he took over the CPR training from our medical unit right. for the CBs. So we worked, we have to work as teams. Uh, uh, no person is an island, and uh, especially in the medical field. And that's what I used to tell the corpsman. I don't care what your rank is. That's man-made. That's man-made. But when we have a patient in front of us or an emergency in front of us, I don't care what your rank is. Mm -hmm. Like I won't ask my plumber, did you go to college or didn't you? <laughs> or my electrician. You know, I'm not <laughs> interested in that. I'm sorry. Not I don't know if they're licensed. Yeah, yeah. Can you do the job? You know? And 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 that's all I ask of people. Uh, are you quali can you do the job for me? And if you do a good job, believe me, I will give you good reports yearly, and and you will get promoted. I I can almost guarantee it. You will get promoted. I've only had one corpsman in all of my career that said, I could have gone to medical school, you know, and I said. Okay, <laughs> why didn't you? And one of the answers he gave was, my wife didn't want me to go. I said, can I call up your wife? <laughs> uh, no, I have to go somewhere else right now. <laughs> and I'm going, <sighs> no, okay. don't lie, you know, and don't get jealous. Look at what jealousy did to Germany, the jealousy yields hate, and hate yields the worst things in us. Right. Now, uh, it's pretty clear here you know, from, from our, our conversation that uh, your, your time in the Navy was a very positive experience. Very for you. positive for me. If I wanted, was lucky. If you wanted to kind I of sum up what it is that you learned from it or took out of it, what would that be? Um, camaraderie, respect. Um, and getting respect in turn, um, and being humble, 
and making you realize that you're just a mere mortal that has to go through a journey mm -hmm. that we all have to go through. And the great, great equilibrator is you're born naked, <laughs> and guess what? You're going to go naked either way. All right. But uh, that important lessons and, and teamwork. Just, and I, I still miss that teamwork that we don't have as much in the civilian sector of medicine. And especially now, these are difficult times for American medicine uh, because it's transition time. Mm -hmm. So many changes have come down the road. I still work part-time as an allergist in my old office. And the changes are overwhelming. And my generation, my generation is at fault, and I blame my generation, because during medical school, most of us said, we really don't want to know much about the business of medicine. Mm -hmm. We want to see patients. We want to help a little bit each patient and so on. But leave the business up to somebody else. <laughs> oh, boy. It was like a tsunami coming down the road. The insurance industry said, oh, we'll help. The business community said, oh, we'll help you. We'll, we'll help you organize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now. And now you got the government, too. Now you got the government on top of us. And, <laughs> and supposedly in 2018, all these software systems for electronic records are supposed to interface so that if you get sick in California, they can access your medical record in California into our system. And they claim it's going to be hack proof. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll just don't tell the Russians. Uh. <laughs> the Russians are chess players. We forget that. All right. Uh, anyway, your, your own uh, journey here has been a pretty remarkable one, so I'd just like to close here by thanking you for taking the time to share it today. Oh, thank you for having me.